Hi, and welcome back to the European VC, the go-to podcast for everything European VC. If you love our show, share it with your friends and join us in the EU VC community syndicates at theeuropeanvc.com. Today, we're happy to welcome Daniel, founding partner of 11 Ventures. Heralding from Bulgaria, Daniel is one of the pioneering fathers of seed investing in southeastern Europe, having founded 11 Ventures all the way back in 2012. Daniel is a past board member of EBAN and has a long career of investment roles behind him. We first met Daniel at How to Web last year and can't wait to reconnect for this year's event on the 21st and 22nd of September in Bucharest, Romania. But will we be seeing you there? If you enjoy our content, do support us by hitting the follow button, giving it a review and following us on LinkedIn. Want to be on top of who the best up and coming emerging VCs in Europe are and maybe even invest with them? Register for our newsletter at theemergingvc.substack.com and be the first to get in the know. Daniel, welcome to the European VC. It's been quite some time. We actually met 11 Ventures, you specifically, How to Web last year. And I guess if we'll see any of you guys this year there? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for the invite. We'll be there in a um, few weeks. So it will be a fun meeting again. Absolutely. We're very much looking forward to attending as well this year in person. Before we start, Daniel, we always like to hear the uh, founding stories, and I'd love to hear the founding story behind Eleven Ventures. Let's maybe start with a name. Where does it come from, and how did it all come to be? So Eleven is a is a metaphor for escape velocity, and it comes from uh, our belief that we had among the founders that whatever we we built, we wanted an organization that. The, could actually help the local talent overcome all the challenges uh, that they face in the region and build uh, great companies. So that's why Escape Velocity was a very good metaphor for actually overcoming everything that you have here and you could succeed. Because uh, before, uh, when I was an entrepreneur and uh, early stage investor in the early days, it was very tough to get access to markets, to talents, to mentors, to anything. And when I experienced myself, I said, okay, whatever I do, we should overcome this challenge. So this is how we started. Oh, that's too good. I love it when these fun names have a story like that. So that's just great. Could you just maybe dive a bit more into exactly 11 Ventures thesis and what are you investing in? What's your focus? Why are you doing it like that? Why do you think that you're perfectly positioned to, to capture the opportunity and so on? We are now into our third fund, which is our largest fund, it's 60 million euro. Actually, 10 years ago, we started as an accelerator, one of the largest accelerators in Europe, because it, it had a capital of 12 million euro, which was committed capital, which was uh, something unheard of at the time, because most of the accelerators at the time were actually fundraising every year, which was uh, quite tiring. So, but we quickly evolved and uh, we grew with the needs of the ecosystem, because uh, the entrepreneurs, uh, they were just becoming wiser and more mature with each year. So we said, okay, we have to evolve. We evolved with them, but we actually stayed at, at the stage of pre-seed seed investment because this is the, I mean, everything before Series A, we call it early stage because it's the foundational time for any company. I know that a lot of people are actually making this uh, micro-segmentation of this whole period, but as one uh, other peer from the VC world, he said, would Everything is early stage, and I agree with him. So we like that space because we understand it, because we are a team of ex-entrepreneurs, early stage investors and operators, so we know how to help companies. So this is our favorite space, and I, I don't think that we'll actually move out of this space for the time being. And over time, we, we actually decided to add a few more additional features to the funds we operate. This one is that we go vertical, because I think that it's very difficult to stay 
general and opportunistic and help each and single company that you meet and you like the founder. So over time, we specialize in fintech, in uh, health tech and future of food and future of work. And we've built wider infrastructure around each of these verticals so that we could help better the founders. Like it's not only the capital, but it's also the expertise, the access to markets, all the advisors, mentors, and everybody around. So today we have uh, assets under management of probably exactly uh, north of uh, 70 uh, million euro. We have active portfolio companies uh, around 50 at the time. And it's growing. We have one official unicorn and then two more that are kind of anonymous and <laughs> in the making. And just uh, tell me a bit more about the geos and how you, you know, think about Eastern Europe. I remember us having a conversation with Early Bird about, you know, their focus being growing out of Eastern Europe and now doing pan-European. But you're very true to your thesis around Eastern Europe. We started from the very beginning with the region of southeast of uh, Europe, which, I mean, it's gradually kind of went into, uh, I mean, a little bit enlarged now. But we very much believe in that region because uh, for, this region is totally uh, overlooked. There is very little capital that has been uh, dedicated to this region in the past. Now it's a little bit different, but still compared to other regions, still the capital is, uh, is scarce. And we see a lot of talent. I mean, a lot of the engineering talent is actually situated here. And if you're early, early stage, it's great to have great proximity to the teams that you support. So we are true to that region uh, since the very beginning. Of course, we started having a pipeline from outside of that region and also few investments are outside of uh, that region, which is purely because we increase very much the gravity of our value proposition for the specific niches. But still, we would like to stay here. And I think that uh, if you're close to your founders, you could help them uh, a lot. I'm very often being asked, what is happening in Eastern Europe and is it already now priced the same as the West? You know, am I too late for the party or is there still opportunity to capture before all this? What, what would be your take on that? If you look historically, it's a very interesting place, uh, Eastern Europe, because if you look historically, you would see that uh, that region was chronically underfunded because uh, if you look at the early presentations that Gil Dibner was, was preparing, you hardly could see Eastern Europe on the map there. And it's not much different today. So uh, still the prices of companies are relatively lower than what you could see in Western Europe. Of course, there are founders that are more hustling and they see what happens in other markets. So they decide to price them uh, much higher, but are quickly hit by reality. Because uh, when you talk to early stage investors, you usually talk to your investors in the neighborhood. So uh, very few are prepared to pay these prices. So from that perspective, I think that prices are much more reasonable uh, even before the correction compared to, uh, to other parts in, uh, like Western Europe or the US. And second, I think that the capital is still very much limited, especially the, the specialized capital that you're looking for. If you're a health tech company, there are very few parties that you could talk to in, in the region. However, there are very few actually investors that are outside of that region that would like to go that early and actually invest. Of course, this happens at the seed stage, especially if you have an investor like us, who is specialized, who actually is bringing uh, one of their partner uh, VCs uh, from other parts of the world. But otherwise, it's not that easy. If I were to ask a similar question, Daniel, but more on like, what's the LP landscape and how it's been developing and I know this isn't a very fair question because it's a big region, right? <laughs> but I'd love to hear your thoughts around that. How has it been developing? What's happening on the LP side? It's developing relatively well compared to, let's say, 10, 15 years ago. I mean, 15 years ago, there were only three investors. And it was a European investment fund, European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. You could see IFC here and there and some uh, crazy private investor approach. <laughs> Today, it's much different. I mean, uh, what you see today is that European Investment Fund is extremely active in the region because they launched these special mandates with governments where you could actually would like to boost the local ecosystems. So there is enormous amount of money coming through that source. And I would say that if you combine all the different uh, mandates and programs that they currently run in the region, it's probably more than one billion, huge amount of money. 
is less active because they're more into, let's say, late stage uh, things and private equity uh, initiatives. Yeah. IFC has left the place because uh, it's considered now to be a more mature place, although they have uh, one or two tickets uh, in regional funds. Yeah. But the great thing that happened over the last 10 years is that I mean, first, the angel investing has developed a lot. So when we started 10 years ago, we were like, you know, this uh, philosopher, uh, dude, genius, I'm not sure what is the, the right pronunciation, that was walking with the lantern in, in daylight trying to find uh, people. So it's the same human beings. And so it's the same. We were looking with the lantern trying to find angel investors and they were not. Now in Bulgaria alone, there, I would say, more than 100 active angel investors. I would say that uh, it's a similar situation in Greece, it's a similar situation in Romania, in the Balkans, uh, in Turkey, and elsewhere. So we have a, a large angel investor network. Now, out there started the family offices, the local family offices with larger tickets. You see now corporations uh, putting money aside to invest in VC. So it's evolving. And at the same time, you could see even unusual institutional investors that are more staying that in their part of the world, like Western yeah. Europe, are actually putting money here. I would point to uh, Draper Esprit, which is now Molten, uh, investing in early bird or Isomer Capital and few others that are active now in, in that region. Absolutely. So the landscape is changing and it's changing because the success of that region is becoming more visible to the rest of the world. Yeah. I have another question on that front. We often hear about these different national schemes across Europe that are perceived as, to some extent, kind of benchmarks and playing an important role in driving more capital into the asset class, into venture. You know, we talk about SEIS in the UK. We talk about the, the French tax breaks. We've also had a guest talking about the Dutch program where you get tax breaks if you do fund the fund investing. You know, So there's a couple of kind of references here and there. Would you highlight anything in Eastern Europe that is interesting in terms of kind of policy or government-led initiatives to attract more capital into the ecosystem? The major programs that you, you have here are actually the so-called Jeremy program of the European Investment Fund. So this is how actually we started uh, 2012. This was a program ran by the EF. It's, uh, I mean, they, they pull resources from different sources like EU and uh, national budgets. You have a, a much larger program uh, that was run in, uh, in Greece. You have now in uh, Croatia, you have now in Romania as well, that is supporting a number of uh, new emerging funds. When they started, it's actually a great way to actually to kickstart a VC ecosystem. Yeah. At the time, like 10, uh, 15 years ago, it was very difficult to get the support of the private capital and to have new emerging fund managers because at the time, what was happening is that uh, you had not local fund managers, but rather fund managers from abroad that were actually making some uh, partnership with local teams and, and they were uh, fundraising for this region, which was suboptimal because you don't have the commitment to that region. Exactly. And, and you need to grow these local fund managers that they have the commitment to the region. So you have that, you have the uh, EBRD commitment to Turkey, for example. So I would say that these are the major programs that you have. However, what I'm seeing more and more is that after the initial push from a European Investment Fund, you see uh, the private capital following in. This is the most amazing thing, because I think that this whole ecosystem should rely more on the private capital than actually on the public funds. Because this is the true test, not only for the fund managers, but also for the ecosystem. That's why our second fund, we said, okay, we have to go entirely private. And one of the major reasons was that it's, it's incredibly, I mean, it's great to have European Investment Fund as your LP, but when it comes to early stage, uh, you would like to have your LP also aligned with the interest, with the development of your portfolio. And there's no better thing than having private investors who are also established entrepreneurs and technology leaders that could Absolutely. deploy their networks and, and knowledge and everything else for the growth of your portfolio companies. That's an important point, right? And I'd love for, to ask you to dive a bit deeper into how you explicitly do that. How do you work with your LP base to uh, you know, create value for your portfolio companies as well? Just to give you an example, I mean, our, our second fund, uh, I mean, we used private capital in all of the funds. I mean, what happened with the first fund, which was the accelerator, is that at some point of time, we raised private capital, entirely private capital, to buy out 
European Investment Fund. And then we floated the core of the portfolio on the local stock exchange where we attracted more private capital. Very much in the fashion of what Draper is now today, Molten did, I think, three years uh, before us. And then the second fund was entirely private again. And then the third one, which is 60 million, like two thirds of the fund is actually from the same investors, of course, enhanced uh, pool of uh, both investors, but again, private money. Because we very much believe that, as I said, we should be aligned. I mean, not only the fund manager, but also the LP base. So we engage them in the life of the companies in terms of advisors, but most often in terms of access to markets for the portfolio companies, access to clients. In the due diligence, we reference check founders. Very often, we validate uh, concepts because there are a lot of, of our LPs that are actually entrepreneurs, are very successful entrepreneurs in, in the fields that we look at. So we very quickly validate concepts, ideas, uh, anything. But later on, when we try to bring value to, to the companies, there are three or four areas that we engage them. It's, it's one is when they act as mentors or advisors. And some of these LPs are part of our entrepreneur in residence program, or they have become uh, venture partners with us, which means much more involvement. But often it's about building partnerships, critical partnerships uh, where the company is needed, or access to first clients when it's yeah. very critical. Uh, so these are the type of areas that we try to engage them. It's very tough to do it on an ad hoc basis. That's why we, we build a framework through the platform that we are building so that it's actually in a systematic way. Uh, unless you have it in a systematic way, it's, it's very tough to manage all these type of relations because we have uh, probably around 90 yeah. private investors. And if you don't have a system in place, it will be an ad hoc basis and rarely you could get the, the most of the private. I actually think that what you're saying there's uh, that's the perfect pivot to one of the topics that we wanted to talk to you about, which is VC value add. Because what you're saying is often that the problem is that in VC, we have the tendency to tell founders that you're going to get so much, you're going to be there all the way, but then you're a one-person show or a two-person show and reality is hidden. It's pretty difficult to be that operational, hands-on investor for a portfolio of 15, 20 companies. There's both a word of caution to the micro VCs or, or the emerging managers coming up. I'd love for you to expand on that, but I then after that also go into then, how do you do it? And what's the structure that you've built, what you just said, right? The platform and putting things into systems. I'd, I'd love to dive into this. Something that we've done uh, in the last few weeks because we do it constantly is just to get feedback from the portfolio companies, from the founders, but not only ours, but uh, actually founders that are not part of our portfolio so that we understand their needs, especially at, at this early stage where we focus on. So the interesting insight that we got is that, as you said, everybody is saying we bring value, but it's actually extremely difficult to do that because, as you said, the teams are small. You have a lot of things on your table, so it's not possible to do it unless you have a dedicated team for that. And because of that, that everybody is saying we bring value. Actually, the founders were conditioned not to expect anything from their investors, which is really uh, very pity. I mean, and most of the founders that we talk to they actually look at their investors as just an ATM machine. <laughs> So that you get money and the only thing that you want from them is just to leave you alone. Sometimes we see investors that are willing to help, but their help is too intrusive and actually is breaking the relationship between investors and founders. We have this in a few of our portfolio companies with other investors that are first-time fund managers. And they don't really care what the founders are looking for. They just say, okay, you need that. So they're pushing whatever they want from them. And they're breaking up. And I think that it's very important that first you listen to the founders because they have different needs. Like, for example, contrary to maybe even to your understanding, because you talk with a lot of VCs, is that rarely in the early stage phase, people need help in, with recruitment. Because at, at that stage, the needs are totally different. The needs are about building the product, polishing the, refining the value proposition, and building the right foundation and everything else, which has nothing to do with recruitment because recruitment comes later when you need like your CMO, your other roles like CEO, etc. However, in the very beginning, for example, what are the major insights is that 
people need a framework that brings discipline, that brings, okay, how should we read our numbers? I mean, what are our metrics? Are we doing well or not? Uh, so if we're not doing well, what we should do? So actually asking all of that questions and giving them the resources so that they could benchmark so that they know exactly what are the foundational blocks that they could do so that they are ready for the next stage and what they should achieve with your money so that they're well positioned, not only in terms of their growth plans, but also for next investment. And for example, they need a CFO from the very beginning, which is absolutely counterintuitive to many of the beliefs of the founders and many of the beliefs of the early stage investors. And I should say that we had incredible fights with uh, some of our best founders about this thing. But the moment they got a CFO like five years later, they said, uh, you should have pushed us <laughs> uh, more to have it from day one, which is, I mean, uh, the total <laughs> oxymoron. But anyway, you could help a lot your founders, but you should do it in a systematic way. It's impossible to do it in ad hoc. We tried it before, we failed, and currently the platform that we've built is something that now we could afford it because we have a larger fund. It's impossible to afford it when you have a, a small fund because it costs money. Even today, it's very interesting. I was thinking about our call today. And the thing is that today, all the LPs are pushing all the fund managers, especially the emerging one, to lower their management fees. And now it's not the rule 220, like usually you have. The management costs are actually as a percentage of the fund are actually lower, when, especially when you have uh, institutional investors. And this is, if you think about it, this is detrimental. Why? Because this means that you limit the resources of these people. And instead of these people actually investing in a platform, you tell them you don't need a platform. You should do well with the resource you have, which is not working. And then you see a mediocre result and they say, why you don't you have mediocre results? So nobody's happy at the end. And it's, it's just a matter of a few hundred yeah. thousand per year, which is not a big difference. And for example, today we are investing from our own pockets this amount of money because we know that this is extremely important for the success of the portfolio. So we have a dedicated partner who is head of platform. We have a few more people that are part of the team. And we now plan to enhance the team with a few more people. Once you have a system in place and you have a playbook for the product, playbook for uh, customer discoveries, uh, we have a design studio. We make the design sprints with the teams. You have the framework for managing your finances and building your governance. We have a CFO as a service. And all these components, probably there are a few more that I forget about it now. But unless you have it, they have all these dedicated resources and they work in systematic ways. And even the way we think about platform is an our operating system. Because our operating system helps us to actually organize in the best possible way the internal resources so that we have a tailor-made game plan for each company, but also to integrate in a frictionless, seamless way all the external resources like the OLPs, like all the mentors, all the advisors, all the corporates, anything that you brought to the table for each particular vertical. If you don't have this system in place, this operating system, this is impossible yeah. to do it. Yeah. Now we completely agree. We just, yeah. you know, we've just participated in a fund where we, you know, part of the fee is that you have a setup fee or basically to help build out that platform because that's also what the, the founding team was doing there. They said, we cannot do this without building this platform. We absolutely are in complete agreement there, Daniel. And putting our money as well. <laughs> and, our, and, our, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and our syndicate's money as well. No, I was going to say, Daniel, I completely agree. I know I think... Many would be surprised or they'd rather not see it that, you know, some GPs that are managing very interesting sized, I'd say, funds are actually not that comfortable on, on a personal financial level, right? And I think the same way as every single mature professional venture investor understands the importance of the founders not having to worry too much about their survival to be able to grow the company. Yeah. Mature and sophisticated LPs understand exactly the same on the VC level, right? And I think that's sometimes where we're in Europe, not everywhere, but in many geos of Europe, we're still kind of a bit behind and catching up, I'd say. 
and then you get the success stories manage to get the fund to a point where they don't even justify fees anymore. It's like invest or invest. And if you don't want to invest by buy, there's people waiting to invest, right? So it's like it's like yeah. this stupid kind of paradoxical situation that we're in where, you know, you see the biggest tier US funds, their decks are three pages long and they say, track record has been X, fees are this, thank you, bye. <laughs> and people either invest or don't. It's ridiculous. Yeah, I actually would go even a step further. If you remember in the past, one of the initiatives that 500 startups did, uh, they had Series A program. And what uh, Dave McClure at the time uh, said is that part of the money, like $50,000 or whatever was the amount, should be spent on marketing. This is like a dedicated amount of uh, the whole investment. So here... I even would encourage like the big uh, institutional investors, whether it's European Investment Fund or others, to insist that part of the management fees, they could be a little bit higher, they actually go for building this platform, especially for early stage funds, because this would change dramatically like the professionalism, the, the maturity of the whole ecosystem here. Absolutely. And I, I think you nailed it, especially emerging, right? Because <laughs> then yeah. that, that need decreases over time. Of course, you've built the rails yeah. for it. It's funny that you bring up 500 startups, now 500 global. Everyone's changing names. Uh, but yeah. uh, I also really enjoyed their, They have a fund modeling uh, workshop. I also really enjoyed participating in one of them where they also advocated for first time funds to have, you know, you have your fees, but then you have like set up fees similar to what Andreas was saying. And you should kind of separate them to make it clear that this is building the infrastructure for the success of this firm, not the fund of this firm. And as an LP, you get also that access to the firm in the long run. Daniel, we're running out of time. Unfortunately, I was enjoying this bit of the conversation a lot. And we always like to end our episodes with a quick fire round. The quick fire round is when we ask you quick answer questions, 30 to 60 seconds each. Are you ready? Sure. Daniel, first question. What areas, sectors or technologies excite you the most that other people around you don't really feel that excited about? Actually, health tech. And uh, I would say biotech in a region uh, where it's considered not to be allowed to produce uh, biotech because it's a, like a protected area for other places. I started in bio, so I love that. <laughs> I won't add anything. Second question, what are your top tips for emerging VCs across Europe who are fundraising? Don't fundraise from institutional investors. Raise from private investors, family funds, people that you know. I think that this is your best chance today and uh, they could be part of your extended team. And this is a chance for you to build a great fund. Third and final question is, what is the most counterintuitive thing you've learned since you've been in venture? Maybe in the very beginning where it was counterintuitive for me, then it became uh, more intuitive is that <laughs> the success of any early stage investing activity is a community project. The first thing, you have to build a great community and to manage this community. So not managing so much the portfolio, but managing the community because the community is this safety net that changes the odds for success for the companies that you invest in. That's why we had this slogan in our second or third year. I remember it was uh, one of 11, which means that anybody, it's the founders, the crew that manages 11, the advisors, the mentors, the investors, everybody is one of 11. I love that. We always say that the future of tech investing is human. So absolutely love that, Daniel. Thanks a million so much for joining us. It has been awesome. And I hope we'll see you soon when we are going to Bucharest. Yeah, thank you very much for the invite and giving me the opportunity. And I'll see you in a month. Absolutely. Thank you for listening to this episode of The European VC, the go-to podcast for everything European VC. If you love our show, share it with your friends and join us in the EU VC community syndicates at theeuropeanvc.com. Want to be on top of who the best up-and-coming emerging VCs in Europe are and maybe even invest with them? Register for our newsletter at theemergingvc.substack.com and be the first to get in the know.